I'd like to uh, point out that Karen Conkley is my grad student. She's just started my lab, and we're working on this together. She's going to lead this project. We're very excited about it. But before I tell you about it, I wanted to thank the Mind Science Foundation for the wonderful support of science they've been doing for many years, and thank all of you for keeping it going. I think it's just wonderful, and we're all very grateful that you've been doing this. It's very important. Uh, and so I'd like to invite you to be involved in our research a bit. And to start off, let me ask you this question. Uh, have you ever wanted to be able to fly like Superman? You could have your arms outstretched, you could fly over San Antonio, you could fly somewhere else, you could go to the moon, anything you wanted if you had that ability. So one way to do that is to buy these virtual reality goggles. You put them on, it puts visual information into your brain, and that makes you think like you're actually flying. And maybe if you get a fan, you could blow the air through your face and you could feel it. But you know, you can do all that. It's not really like flying like Superman, quite. It's not the real thing. It's not even like dreaming it, because in fact, if you dream it, it's very real. That's one thing about our dreams is they're the original virtual reality. When you have a dream, all the senses are there, and you really think it's happening to you. In fact, most of you, when you remember a dream, you're, you have this experience of thinking it was real until the moment you wake up and realize, oh, actually, that was just a dream. But up until that point, you're accepting it as uh, real even when bizarre things happen. And it's, you know, the strangest things can happen, and you just keep going on with it, not sort of questioning, is it a dream or not? Well, there's a special type of dream that's called a lucid dream. And it's a rare event, but when people have that experience, they get the realization that they are dreaming during the dream. And they continue to dream, and they understand, actually, I'm sleeping somewhere. But right now, I'm having this experience of being somewhere else, and it's all manufactured by my brain. And in fact, I can control it if I understand that, and I can make anything I want happen. I can do anything. I can fly like Superman, and so on. And so that's an interesting phenomenon that we wanted to study. In addition to trying to understand dreams in general, because science has had a hard time studying dreams. It's been difficult. Dreams are something you learn about another person's dream only when they wake up and they tell you about what happened. And we thought, well, we could do better than that, perhaps, by interviewing someone during a dream itself. If we could have a conversation with someone, then we could actually have a better way to study what's going on. So that's the idea. It's called uh, a two-way communication between the experimenter and the dreamer. And someone comes to my lab, as shown here, they put on an electrode cap, and they're wired up, and they get to go to a comfortable room to have a nap. They lay down, they have a nap, and we record their brain activity like that, and we can monitor what's happening in their brain as this happens. And so we've been doing this for a while, but we haven't been studying dreams yet. That's our new adventure here. Um, and so when, when we do this, we can look at um, this idea of two-way communication, but it really, kind of seems like an impossible thing to do. How could you possibly communicate, have a conversation with someone we're dreaming? Well, in my lab, we, we have an answer. We like to say, well, we have a nap for that. <laughs> in fact, we also have an app, because part of what we do is to use this app on a smartphone to make it work. And I'll tell you a little bit about how that works. Of course, there, there are a couple problems having the communication being both ways and sort of making someone have a lucid dream. It's not very easy to do. People have worked at that. It's very labor-intensive, labor but we have kind of a shortcut that we're working on. And so the first part is, how can we figure out how to make this uh, communication happen? How do we get the sleeper to tell us something? Because when you're asleep, your body is paralyzed. And so if you're in a dream, you're walking around, but in your bed, your body isn't moving. But there's an exception to that, which is your eyes. So when you move your eyes in your sleep, your actual eyes move too. And so we can instruct people that, when they want to signal us, they can signal with a code like left, right, left, right. And if they do that code, their actual eyes are moving, and we can register that in our recording. So here's a little segment of EEG recordings, and you can see in the circular area, there's this wiggle that's the left, right, left, right signal. So it's very obvious signal. We can see that even during REM sleep and detect when someone's telling us something. And in fact, we can go into more advanced signals with greater numbers of left, rights and sort of have a little, a little code that works out a conversation. So that's how they can communicate with us. And this has actually been done before. But the part that hasn't been done is how do we communicate with them? And to, to explain that, I have to tell you about a, the, some of the research we've been doing in the past few years where we're trying to understand how learning happens. And we think that when you learn something while you're awake, it doesn't just stick in your brain. In fact, it might, you're going to forget it unless you rehearse it. Practice is very important. And we found that one of the ways to practice we do every night without knowing it, which is we rehearse information in our sleep. One of the things that sleep allows us to do is integrate the new memories we've gotten with the old memories and decide which are important to keep and so on. 
I've written about that in a few papers. One I wrote for a journal that's called Frontiers for Young Minds, and it's a great journal that's pitched for eight to 14 year olds. So it's science education, making science interesting for kids. So when I wrote my paper for that journal, I called it, do house elves clean your brain while you sleep? So this is, you know, house elves are these creatures from Harry Potter's world where the kids know all about that and the, the creatures clean up everyone's house overnight kind of invisibly and you can make all the mess you want and they clean it up. And so that's the idea here that, well, there aren't really house elves, but it's like that's happening because the brain is busy working through memories. Your brain is very active during sleep and that's one of the things you're working through. And now in order to study it, um, we've been using a couple of interesting methods where we present soft sounds or words to people while they're asleep. And we've published that in many other papers besides this uh, funny one. So in standard journals, we have a lot of publications, including one that's going to be on the cover of Scientific American in the next issue. And the idea is to understand how this works, we wanted to manipulate the processing of memories during sleep. And we can do that by playing sounds that remind people of something they just learned. And we know that that changes memory storage because, not just because we're looking at the EG, but because when they wake up, they're better at remembering that information than other information. So we can really strengthen memories during sleep and sort of understand that normal process. So now we want to take that method, which we've been using entirely in slow wave sleep, a different type of sleep. We want to move it over with this study with Karen to REM sleep and look at dreams. So that's the two-way interaction part. So this is a recording from one of our volunteers. We'll call her Linda and we had recordings from different places on the head, and we played a sound. Once we noticed she was in REM sleep, we played a special sound that she heard. It wasn't very loud, so it didn't wake her up, but she knew that sound because it was on her smartphone app, and during the day, she heard that sound, and every time she heard it, she, know, she knew, well, I have to check and see if, is this a dream, or am I awake right now? And she would get used to asking herself that question whenever you heard that sound. So she was kind of conditioned to make that check when she heard that sound, and then we did it in REM sleep, and she made the check, and she discovered, wait, actually, I'm in a dream right now, and I have to make that signal left, right, left, right. So about four or five seconds later, at time two, she makes that signal. And so this is the beginning of two-way interactions. We want to ask more questions, get more answers, and have this be replicated in other people. So that's our project, is to try to use this method to move us forward so we can ask questions about what is sleep consciousness all about and actually get some more information about how it works. So finally, to finish up, in addition to trying to study sleep consciousness in this way and understand how, how that might vary in different sleep stages and so forth, we also think there's some potential applications of our method. And so we might be able to use the same kind of strategy to help people. So one of the ideas is we can help people that have recurring nightmares sort of deal with their nightmares by using these sounds and inducing people to understand that they're dreaming at the time and then control what's happening. Uh, maybe go ahead and talk to the monster that's, that's bothering them and figure out what that's about. Another idea is some people have very expert skills. They might be an expert musician or athlete and they want to just get a little better so they can win the competition or something. So they might be able to use their dreams to practice their skills and rehearse it in the same environment, get a little bit better. Another idea we have is problem solving. So you might be struggling with a problem in your life and having trouble dealing with different people or something at work, and you could then visit that problem in your dream and think more creatively, perhaps, about another solution. So dreams are very thought to be a time where some creative solutions come, and we could provoke that to happen even more often to enhance creativity in that sense. A fourth idea is dealing with uh, anxiety people might have. They're nervous about something, maybe they have a phobia. They can deal with that in the safe environment of a dream and work through the problem and maybe be better when they're awake and, and be able, better able to deal with that. And then lastly, of course, their imaginary experiences like flying you might want to have or, well, whatever you want to do in your dreams, you could do that once you can control them better using our method to make this kind of dreaming happen. So that's the story. We want to try to understand what the mind of the dreamer is going on and, of course, use our neuroscience methods to measure how that's happening. And sort of we think about this as kind of having a conversation with someone off in a distant world, maybe the, not almost like the guy walking on the moon for the first time, and just having this conversation. We're in there in our lab, and we can talk to this person while they're dreaming and have this interaction, and who knows what questions. Maybe you have ideas for the questions we might want to ask them once we're able to do that. So thank you very much for your attention.